Dr. Davis, could you speak about um, Bluetooth in automobiles? Uh, because right. I now have this car where I'm hands-free, so I'm legal, mm -hmm. but I worried the other day when you said about my head becoming an antenna. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let me explain. That's, I'm so glad you asked. I'm really glad you asked. Let me explain. The latest study from Sweden that I mentioned very briefly in my talk a few days ago, which is the only study in the world to have followed people for 25 years or more who've used cell phones. It's the only study in the world. They were able to get data on people who had primarily used a phone in their car with a Bluetooth antenna going through the car compared to people who, let's say this is a phone, used a phone like this as they're driving. Okay. Now, a Bluetooth through your car means that the antenna is going through your car roof. You understand, if you do not have a Bluetooth in your car going through your car roof or plug into your former cigarette lighter adapter, which you can do because you can get one of these adapters, if you do not have either of those two devices, then your head becomes the antenna when you hold the phone next to your head. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. But if you have the Bluetooth device, according to this latest study just published a few weeks ago from Sweden, there, you do not have an increased risk of brain cancer from cell phones. You do not. Now, having said that, one of my concerns and there, is that what about the baby in the back seat? What about these Teslas which have actual kind of like an iPad computer right there in the front? I wrote to Tesla and I asked them for information on their Wi-Fi exposure. The uh, Guess what? I'm still waiting for an answer. But Tesla it's not may not be the worst. May not may not be bad at all. But they're not even thinking about this. And I think we do have to think about this because now you have cars that have Wi Fi that tell you your tire pressure. That's a Wi Fi signal. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's going maybe it's fine. I don't know if it is, and I think we have a right to ask. I don't think there's anything wrong with asking that question, but I'm glad you asked about the car as well. That's important. I have the tire thing too. No, no, but but I, I'm not I want to be clear. The fact that we don't know mm -hmm. does not mean it's a problem, but it does mean we need to find out. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re-ask the question in a way because I want your answer to be clear to me and everyone else. You said yesterday that infants or little children have a ten time greater exposure. This study most likely looked at adults. Absolutely right. And what I said specifically is that the bone marrow of the skull of an infant, when tested with a simulation that's been validated and computer generated, their bone marrow will absorb 10 times more radiation from a cell phone smack against the head, not from a Wi-Fi in a car. Okay? Oh, okay. And that bone marrow of the child will absorb 10 times more radiation than the bone marrow of, of an adult. And their brain, which is mostly fluid and fat, will absorb twice as much radiation as compared to that of an adult. Well, do you suspect that the child in the back seat or next to the Tesla, and I, I, I actually looked, looked at Tesla and it's actually an iPod in the front of the car. Do you iPad. think, iPad, iPad. Yeah. Uh, can you, um, would you believe, as I'm thinking right now, that it most likely would harm the baby or the child of 10-year-old? Distance is your friend. The distance from even the front to the back seat is a few feet. And so it may not be, is the answer. And, and I want to be really clear. I don't want to create the notion that you've got to take your phones and throw them away, although I think everybody should be using their phone less. And as I said before, I think we have to stop living our lives as though we're in an emergency state all the time, that you have to be able to answer 24-7, that you have to keep the phone so you can feel it vibrate and let and so you're you're being really cool because you're looking you're pretending that you're talking to the person you're looking at, but you're really thinking about three other things at the same time and not fully engaging socially, which is happening, I think, to, to all of us. We think we're multitasking, but in fact, evidence is very clear that multitasking is diminishing the quality of our social experiences with everybody nowadays. I have, I have a new term for it. It's called the anti-social media. That's very good. Anti-social media. And yeah. Rafi, the children's, thank you, Rafi, the children's singer, has a, a wonderful book called Light Web, Dark Web, where he talks about the fact that these tools are really distancing people from one another. We think they're connecting us, but they're creating barriers in a, in a strange way that we don't even appreciate. When you, when you sit down with your husband or your wife, and 
They pick up, they take a phone call and you're having dinner. I mean, people have got to reclaim the private life that is so important for our health. I'll try to be brief, but I'll add to the story. They introduced cell phones in Switzerland because Switzerland was so economically endowed in those days. And I was enthralled. They, uh, a guest came to us from Switzerland, a lovely man, with a suitcase and showed me the phone, and I just couldn't believe it. And, you know, yeah, my mind was, you know, does the car have a wire connected to the curb? He said, no, there is no wire. I just couldn't get that through my head. And he said, you know, the next time he came back to us, eight months later, he said, I threw away my cell phone. And I said, what, you're insane. What do you talk, you could talk on the phone? He said, we realized in great part in Switzerland that it took time out of our life, that we were no longer taking quiet time driving in the car. So what Dr. Davis said and what all of you clapped to, please remember this. I know this is a high-speed lunacy, constantly thinking you have to communicate. NYU here has to give, in the first year freshman classes now, a class on communication because I can tell you hiring young people today, eight out of ten do not know how to communicate anymore. So uh, there's no doubt that the agribusiness, the pharmaceuticals, and the government uh, have been misinforming us for uh, a very long time, and they're spending billions and even trillions of dollars to do so. So having been at the seminar for the last three days, I'm going to say thank you until you tell me to stop. Thank you, 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 thank you. And thank you. Okay. Because, you know, we're bombarded by this, obviously, wealth of misinformation. And to have real, accurate information and sitting here is just – the energy is so positive, and it's like – it's like I don't have to, you know, block this and block this thought and block that. Just it's free-flowing information. So – um, I want to thank the whole panel for that. And then I have a question, too, for Sherry. Um, Sherry, right? Um, I became a raw vegan eight months ago. As you can see, eat raw, live long. It's amazing. My sky is purple. What's um, it say? Eat raw, live long. Yeah. Eat That's raw. good. Yeah. And the question I have for you is at what temperature does food uh, become compromised? Now, I've heard 105. I've heard 114. I've seen, we've seen amazing photos of food that is uh, energized and it's charged. And then you see the SAD, standard American diet food, that's not charged. So w that temperature to me is like the most, it's like learning my one, two, threes. Uh, if, is it 105, 107? Whatever the number it is, it is. But that's, a, that's an important thing uh, when I'm shopping, uh, you know, for food or uh, that it's raw or that the internal composition of the food is not compromised, especially the energy levels, which... I think raw, most raw vegans will tell you that we're, uh, you know, we, we, love, we love the energy from the food. Well, it's... I want to add a question to oh, you. Oh, okay. For you. It's, mm -hmm. it's related, Sherry. Yeah. Um, what about uh, tea, uh, coffee-like beverages, and things of this sort? Uh, if one is going to use warm liquids, how, when, and how do you recommend, you know, combining, et cetera? Right. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that in two parts. Um, first of all, uh, the... the the safe temperature is going to depend on how on the water content and the fat content mm -hmm. and the kind of nutrients that it has. So, for example, vitamin C is much more delicate than, um, than other kinds of, like, protein, for example. Maybe. So if something has a high water content and you have it in a dehydrator, it's going to take a lot longer before the core temperature becomes the temperature that you have the dehydrator set at, because what you have the dehydrator set at is going to warm the air, but it's going to take quite a while before it penetrates and starts to actually get warm enough to cause evaporation. Mm -hmm. So water content is a big factor. And also the kind of fat, if there is fat involved, um, some fats are very susceptible to rancidity and others are very stable. So I can't give you an absolute answer, right. but, um, but what... I read is that at about 118 degrees for 20 minutes, mm -hmm. in most cases, is safe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Dr. Clement might know more about that than I, but that's the information that is most prevalent out there. Um, and, um, and also, again, the amount of time 
that you have it in a dehydrator is going to make a difference too because you don't want to have something like <clears throat> flax in a dehydrator for a long period of time just sitting there being warm because the omega-3 fatty acids can become rancid, you know. So really fat and water content and also the, the thickness of, of what you have. So it takes longer to penetrate a deeper, more dense mixture. I, I, have I, can't, a, I don't have I have exact... a part B to the question. Um, okay. But it's a little on a tangent. Well, what, why don't okay. we let, Dr. let me go ahead and answer and your question back. as far yeah, as yeah, the, the, tea and the tea and coffee. Um, I, you know, that the Chinese believe that a lot of the herbs don't really release their uh, their benefits until they actually are steeped for a period of time. And so, what I would recommend is that you bring the water to a boil, then let it cool for a little bit before you add the your herbs, and then let it steep until it's warm enough that you're comforted, but not so hot that you would burn your, burn your mouth. And um, because really the tissues in your mouth are very delicate, um, but that will allow the most of the beneficial, like with green tea, you know, you're looking for some antioxidant benefits and so forth. Um, that would be. Or some of the mushrooms. Or, or the, the mushrooms, mushroom absolutely. As far as coffee is concerned, um, Water, they, you know, they have a, a water processing that's probably best, but coffee's already roasted. So the higher temperature you, um, you brew coffee with, the more acidity it has. That's about all I can say about coffee. But you can, a lot of people now are actually using green, green unroasted coffee and steeping it yeah. for the antioxidant value. Now make this second addendum a little brief. Sure. Um, Superfoods and super herbs. Like um, I just feel the accessibility to this in the United States, it's no surprise, is, uh, in other words, uh, try to get access to, uh, you know, I mean, probably more now than ever, uh, but, you know, like uh, 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 ginkgo, uh, not ginkgo, um, goji berries and maca and some of the, some of the most amazing superfoods in the world. Uh, there's no education system in the United States at that. I think it should be taught at, at like, the, the most important thing when you're a first grade uh, kid is to learn exactly what you're putting into your body. I, I read a, a study that said 80% of what you're learning is what you're eating. And to be on the standard American diet and having kids on that, I have two kids myself, nine and six, it's just, it's horrendous. So my question is, how do we get access to, like, uh, uh, the government is obviously very, uh, and, and, the, and the FDA is very suppressing of uh, information that'll keep you healthy. Uh, so how do, we, how do we get access to, like, superfoods of the world, you know, super uh, herbs, things that are really, really, uh, mm. that could be very important and, uh, you know, give good, great health as well? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the information that we get are from people who have a vis vested interest in selling yeah. some of these products. That's and true. I think, you know, I don't really depend on some of the superfoods that a lot of people are, are promoting. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that there are a lot of superfoods that you can buy fresh mm -hmm. that don't have to be transported in, in a, you know, dehydrated at who knows what temperature, um, handled with questionable hygien hygien hygienic um, practices, um, sometimes using uh, labor in foreign countries where they're, you know, getting paid very little. Right. Uh, so those kinds of things are of concern to me, and so... I really um, try to utilize fresh produce as much as possible, and uh, I think that you know kale is a superfood, and and um, mm -hmm. blueberries and are superfoods, yeah, and absolutely. so I, I really focus more on those kinds of foods personally. And not everybody can afford to buy these kinds of foods, sure. and I really would like to prepare foods that everybody can make, no matter where they are in the world, that they have access to these foods, and right. um, and um, so I don't utilize them as much as uh, some people do. Mm -hmm. So maybe Dr. Clement can comment more I'm on that. I'm just going to add briefly to that. I have a colleague in Denmark that searched back, quote, organic goji berries and found out that 93% come from China. They're not organic. Slave labor pretty much is employed on collecting them. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, maca, which people sell as a wonderful food, God forbid you give it to somebody with estrogen active cancers because it's not a great food for those people. So you've got to be very cautious. Super is a very Americana kind of an idea. You know, that's sort of the way we think of things, big and strong and better and quick and easy. And uh, I completely resonate 100% with what Sherry said 
you know, the simple things uh, are it and superior foods rather than superfoods. Yeah, and I also have a concern with the amount of energy that it takes for us to transport these foods. Uh, that's what I was thinking. As you, that's what I was as you were saying, and I'm saying the transportation costs and yeah. everything too, and, and packaging, pasteurization and, potentially and all too. That. I mean, it's it's killed by the time it gets here, you know, or it's whitt whittled down in terms of once it's picked off the the leaf or the tree, you know, you're, it starts losing energy at that at that point. Yeah. So by right. the time it, by the time it gets here, it's. Yeah. The University of California did a study a number of years ago where they took a head of organic lettuce, tested it, 30 minutes later, 52% of the nutrients were gone. 32 minutes later. We're not talking about 32 days later. And I was stunned. I was in California two years ago, and a trucker said to me who his entire job was to truck vegetables. By the time it gets from the West Coast to the East Coast, most of you are consuming vegetables that were picked five to six weeks earlier. I thought it was a week or two. I was shocked when they said that. And another real interesting thing is that they'll, they'll um, uh, distributors will hold food while it's in season. They'll store the food uh, until it's no longer in season so that they can get a higher price for it. So it's in cold storage sometimes for months, and then they can sell it as an out-of-season, higher-priced food when really it started losing energy from the moment that it's picked. And so you're paying a high price for food that is less than optimal. So, so we're over here? Yes. I have a health food-oriented uh, store, or a health-oriented store, and it's called The Water Well. And I was surprised when I got a bump in my breast that ended up being cancerous, and I got a lumpectomy, and now I'm doing IV vitamin C and B17, and I was wondering what your opinion is on that. Uh, well, number one, thanks for trying to do the natural things. Uh, in my book, Supplements Exposed, I explain in detail that there is a gigantic disparity between laboratory-created supplements. Absorbic acid, for instance, which most likely you're being given in an IV, is not vitamin C. Uh, when I was writing my book, one of my friends, I asked her to describe it better than I could. Dr. Scarborough said, when you're writing, explain if I gave you an orange and you threw away the orange and ate the skin. That's what taking absorbic acid is like. Now, when you take that into the body in high doses, thousands of units, Mm -hmm. What happens is the immune system perceives this as an alien or a foreign substance and attacks it. The last thing somebody with a disease wants is any compromised in immunity. So at Hippocrates, our medical team, IVs, cassava, which is tapioca, that's where the vitamin C comes from. Now, we can buy it, others can buy it, but it's significantly more expensive. And I was on Deepak Chopra's show about two years ago, and I love him because he's very smart and we all just like to listen to him. We don't know what the hell he's talking about, but boy, do we like him. <laughs> do you like what he said? Yes. But what did he say? None of us know. You know. But he's brilliant. The guy's brilliant, no question. And I think he read two of my books in two hours a night before, and he knew more about me than I knew about me. <laughs> and, he's, and he basically said, oh, Dr. Clement, he said, it's interesting. There's only one formula. You say we must get the food from the field. And... Not from the laboratory, but the formula is the same. I said, we made a mistake. We should have had a second formula. I said, we should be smart enough to know that there's nuance, there's subcultures, there are things that we have yet to identify. Remember, the, the, the science of nutrition is very young. It's 1928. Mm -hmm. We began it. We got it running by 1970, and now we're probably in kindergarten level with this. So the reality is you need whole foods. And even if we have yet to discover the benefits, the nuance, the subcultures, you'll get them, and someday we can explain why that worked and the other can be harmful. As far as B17, they heat it to three to 400 degrees. It's abscisic acid is the chemical name of it. I'd much rather see you eat, drink wheatgrass. It's riddled with it. At one point when I joined the staff, we used to think that's what helped the cancer. Now we realize that it has numerous phytonutrients in it. Uh, apricot seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, have enormous amounts in, but not 300 to 400 degrees heated, uh, extracted, you know, B17. And one of the things I think have happened in the alternative field, we keep doing the same old, same old, same old, because it's been done, rather than say, hey, let's try to look for new things. Mm -hmm. So 
congratulations doing the right thing. Thanks for being here. And whatever I can do to help you, let me know. That will go away once you're happy about being alive. Wow. I'm coming to you in February. Oh, great. <laughs> Good. Thank one, you. Okay. One other thing. Um, there's a growing consensus among breast oncologists that a large number of lumps and bumps previously called cancer are actually not, or they're precancer. The ductal carcinoma in situ is not necessarily a cancer at all. So I don't want to invade your privacy and talk about that here. We can talk later. But a lot of women have been treated for cancer who did not have cancer. And mm -hmm. we overtreat cancer. Um, and that's a whole other ballgame. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's, it's the most important thing that was said here, mm -hmm. she just said. Oh.